so two years ago we met in Jerusalem at the Hebrew hospital uh, and it was really very incredible that you accepted to meet a French mad writer. I wrote an email to this very important famous professor of biology and genetics and cell cells. First of all, Mr. Yussi Bougani is a PhD of Weizmann Institute and MIT, and he's a head of a very important laboratory of stem cells in Jerusalem, and he's 40 years old. And I am 52, I am no PhD, no, no, no nothing. <laughs> so why did this person accept to meet me? It's a mystery, and maybe it's really one of the questions we have to solve tonight. But um, I want to say uh, thank you for coming. Uh, usually, in Geneva, you say thank you for braving the rain, but now you've braved the sun. It's the worst enemy uh, to come here. And um, so, uh, Professor, you will have to, you will show us um, a little uh, presentation of uh, what you are doing in Jerusalem. And I think it's better that we see this first, and then we can uh, start to have a conversation. I think just before we start, I want to say it's very, uh, uh, please forgive us for our accents. I have a French accent when I speak English. He has an Israeli accent. <laughs> and they are both very funny. Please uh, don't, don't laugh too much, please. Uh, it's important, I think, that uh, writers, novelists, artists in general, speak to scientists, especially in those days we live now, because it's, we are in a very, uh, I think, very important turning point in the history of mankind. I'm very serious. Uh, science is changing our, not only our way of life, but our society. It's changing very fast. We've seen uh, inventions like the internet, for example, how it has changed our lives since 10 years. Totally, or the mobile phones. They have completely revolutionized our uh, way of living. So we cannot, we cannot escape science. Science changes us anyway, whether we want it or not. So we have to be very curious about science. And that's why I think this uh, encounter is important. So please just tell us what is your job, and then we'll discuss, and I will move so we can see the images. Sure. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. Do you, do you hear me? No. no. <laughs> so maybe you do it. I don't. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. So first, I would like to thank uh, the Hebrew University, France Home, and Switzerland for organizing this uh, lovely event, and of course, uh, Frederick for expressing an interest in my research. So today, we'll tell you a bit about how I see the future of medicine. So next slide, please. So before we uh, tell you a bit about what we are doing in the lab, I would like to show you some really uh, terrifying statistics that I downloaded from uh, the NIH website. So this is true only for the US, and this is true only for 2013. And it's talking about organ transplantation. So right now, there are about 120,000 people that are waiting for a, a life-saving uh, organ transplant. Every 10 minutes, a person is added to this list. And in average, uh, 21 people die every day while waiting for a uh, transplantation. And transplantation actually really work. If you will look in these slides here, you can see that many people that got, uh, five, uh, that got organ transplantation can live long life, five years after transplantation, you can see the numbers are really great. So organ transplantation really works. The problem is that we cannot provide enough organs for the patients. So this graph here shows you how many people need organ transplantation.
documentation, and the red bar show you how much we can get, give them. So this is a real problem that we really need to solve. And this really uh, terrifying statistic have led to the emergence of a new field in science, next slide please, which called regenerative medicine. So what is regenerative medicine? Uh, next slide. Yes, so regenerative medicine is a new field that how we, the scientists, try to grow organ or cells outside of the body in an attempt later on to transplant these organ or cells into patients. So this is really a, a crazy idea. And in order to do that, we really need to have cells to fill in these organs. So where we can get these cells, because we cannot just take cells from people. So the solution for that are the magical stem cells. So what are stem cells? Uh, next slide, please. So stem cells are unique cells that we have in our body that have the capacity to retain their characteristic and at the same time to differentiate or to convert into any other cell type. For example, I'm a stem cell now, I can keep myself as stem cell, but on the same time, I can become a neuron or heart cells or kidney cells. So this is what is unique about stem cells. They retain the capability to, become, to stay as stem cells and differentiate to other cell types. Next slide, please. So where we can find them? So we can find them all over our body. Actually, we know now that every organ in our body has unique stem cells. And when cells are damaged, then the stem cells uh, become active and then the cells differentiate into the relevant cell types. So next slide please. So in our body we have a unique stem cells and these are called tissue stem cells. And why they are called tissue stem cells? Because they are specific only to a, a, a specific organ. For example, if we are talking about blood stem cells, so these stem cells can give rise to all the cell types of the, of the blood lineage, but they cannot give rise to other cell types. So if we are talking about neuronal stem cells, cells that we have neurons in the brain, for example, so they can give rise to many neuronal cells, but not to the other cell types. Another problem of these cells is that we cannot actually isolate them from human beings. So what we can do? So for solution for that are embryonic stem cells. Next slide, please. So what are embryonic stem cells? Embryonic stem cells are cells that we can isolate from an embryo after 3.5 days after a, a fertilization. So let me explain a bit about this process. So this is this cell is called zygote. Zygote is, is happening after a sperm fertilized an egg. Then this zygote can divide into two cells, four cells, eight cells, and later on we get this uh, uh, organ that called early blastocyst, which is comprised of two compartments. The inner part is this part, and this part called inner cell mass, and this will give rise to all the embryonic tissues. And we have the outside part that called trophectoderm, and this will give rise to extraembryonic tissues such as the placenta. So if we take the inner part and put it on the dish, on the culture dish, we get these magical embryonic stem cells. And because the inner cell part can give rise to all the cell types, also embryonic stem cells can give rise to all the cell types. So next slide, uh, next slide please. So here you can see an illustration of embryonic stem cells and now I just need to identify the factors that I need to put on these cells in order to convert them into muscles or blood cells or any other uh, kind of cells. So this actually solves everything. We have a unique cells that can grow forever and I just need to trigger them in order to become a, a different cell type. Next slide please. So this is really great, however, there are still two major problems that we need to deal with them. The first problem is ethical problem. So there are some uh, 
people that will say, okay, you are actually killing human embryo in order to get these embryonic stem cells. So this might be true or not, this depends on the person itself. But this is the least of our problem. The major problem is actually the immune rejection. Exactly the problem that, that we have with organ transplantation, also we have here. So although we can generate any cells that we want, still we need to find the matching, the immune matching, that the host and the cells will be the same. Otherwise, the host, the patient that will get these cells, will reject these cells and then we didn't do anything. Uh, next slide, please. So, this problem was solved in 2006 by two Japanese scientists, and this is really groundbreaking, game-changer science that really, really did a lot in the field of stem cells. What these two scientists identified and eventually got the Nobel Prize in 2012, that if they take adult skin cells and put into them four genes, opt for, soft to care for and make, they wait for three weeks, and then suddenly they get embryonic stem cell-like cells. These embryonic stem cells-like cells behave and function exactly like real embryonic stem cells. So this discovery is really crazy, because it really solves the two problems. First, we don't have ethical problems, because we take cells from the skin. We don't kill anyone. And the second problem, which is much more important, we don't have immune rejection because we will take the cells directly from the patient. We can take skin biopsy from a patient, put it in the culture, introduce the four genes, wait three weeks, and then a magic. And then we can get this embryonic stem cells. Next slide, please. So after this discovery, the entire field changed, and then scientists start to say, just a second, if I can take a skin set and put inside four genes and get embryonic stem cell like cells, why should they get embryonic stem cells? They get any setup that they want. They take skin cells and convert it directly into neurons or directly into heart cells. And this is exactly what uh, uh, scientists did. We, they found the important genes for each cell type and then we can take fibroblasts, which are skin cells, and convert them into any cell type that we like. <coughs> so this is really great. Next slide, please. But if you will think about that, we need to think in a way that it will not cause a problem. So if we are talking about patients, it means most probably that they have some genetic mutation that's still inside these cells. So even if you will be able to generate these cells, they still have this problem. So first, we need to fix, correct this mutation or problem in the DNA. And for that, I would like to introduce to you a new technique that's called crispr cas I will show you a short movie that described it. In this technique, we actually modify the genome. If we have a specific mutation, we have a specific disease, we know now how to cut the DNA to remove the bad piece and to introduce a new piece. So if you can just start the movie, it will be great. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome, over 20,000 genes, 3 billion letters of DNA. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health, and thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, researchers have identified thousands of genes that affect our risk of disease. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy, but recently a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. 
The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, researchers studying the system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAM. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut, but the repair process is error-prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. about the technique. I know it may look uh, complicated, but eventually it's uh, one protein that sits on the DNA, cut it wherever we tell it to cut, and then by providing a normal copy, we can actually fix the mutation. So next slide, please. So we have a way to generate a uh, sense of interest. We have a way to fix mutation, so everything looks pink. Uh, can you go one slide, please? So this is what we want to do, I hope, in the very near future. So let's, let's imagine that uh, a patient, let's say Parkinson or Alzheimer patient, come to your clinic. So what you can do is the following. We can take a skin biopsy from this patient and then either directly convert it into neurons, or first reprogram them into embryonic stem cell-like cells, and then we can actually fix the mutation, differentiate these cells into the relevant cell type, so if we are talking about Parkinson, into neurons, and then transplant these cells back into the same patient. But this is not only what we can do. We can actually model the disease, Okay, if we take a skin cell from a Parkinson patient and then convert it into neurons, so we have cells that are sick. And we can actually do a control by fixing the mutation and generating neurons that are normal and actually learn about this disease. Not only that, we can generate millions of cells because as I said, embryonic stem cells go forever and then we can actually do a screen for small molecules in order to identify new drugs
that can treat uh, this specific disease. So this is our goal, and I really hope that it will happen eventually in the near future. Next slide, please. However, not everything is wonderful as I uh, show it here. And here are two problems that we still need to uh, work in order to solve in order to take this field further into the clinic. And the first problem is the quality of the cells. So these embryonic stem cell like cells that we call IPS, we can actually generate, if we're talking about mice, an entire mouse out of these cells. Okay, because these are embryonic stem cells and can generate all the cell type in the body, therefore we can generate an entire mouse. So if we are testing it by using this experiment, we can see that native or normal embryonic stem cells can generate a, a really healthy pups, these are mice of course, but many IPS, embryonic stem cell like cells, clones, can generate only retarded embryo or embryo that will die during pregnancy. So although they have the potential to form any cell types of the mouse body, still it's not perfect and, we need, and still we need to work hard in order to identify the optimal condition in order to generate high quality embryonic stem cell like cells that we can use to the clinic later on. Uh, there is another problem about the direct conversion, about the cell that we can convert from skin cell directly into neurons, that they are not really similar to the endogenous one, and this is really uh, another problem that we need to solve. Uh, next slide, please. So this is actually my goal, the goal of my lab. So in my lab, we are trying to improve the quality of the current model and to generate new model or uh, new cell type for clinical application, uh, like sertoli cells that I will talk in a second. These cells are, cells are important for supporting spermatogenesis, the generation of sperm, and placental stem cells. Uh, next slide, please. And, what, and the way we are doing it, we are using really cutting-edge technology. Uh, we're using the uh, CRISPR-Cas, as I showed you before. We're using embryo manipulation technique and a single cell uh, um, techniques, which is really now is the cutting edge of the science. Next slide, please. So in the rest of my talk, which is not in like five or six more slides, I would like to give you some example how the science that we do really help and really can improve the quality of the cells. So the first question that we ask is we know that these embryonic stem cell like cells are of low quality, they cannot generate an entire mouse, and we really wanted to improve the quality of these cells. In order to do that, we really learn the process of taking skin cells and converting them into embryonic stem cells. So this is really a complicated model, I will not explain it, I will just say that by studying the process of this reprogramming, we identify a network of genes, next slide please, this network that we believe uh, might be able to generate embryonic stem cell like cells with superior quality. And this is exactly what we actually showed eventually. We showed that when we take these genes, the, these four genes, instead of the genes that these young, uh, Japanese scientists identified by random experiment, and we try to reprogram them into embryonic stem cell like cells, we could see that we can generate beautiful, healthy mouse, mice, fivefold more than uh, the Japanese genes. So this really shows you that by learning this process, we can improve the quality of these embryonic stem cells like cells in order to take it one step closer into the clinic. Next slide, please. The second example that I would like to show you is about fertility. So imagine that uh, someone comes to your clinic and said, I'm, I'm sterile, I cannot give rise to uh, babies, but I really want to have children from my own DNA, that they will look like me, they behave like me. I really want this. So now, there is a way to do that. Not yet, but theoretically. So theoretically, what we can do we can take a skin cell from this person, convert them into embryonic stem cell-like cells, 
then fix the mutation that this person has, and then differentiate or convert this embryonic stem cell into sperm. Taking this sperm, inject into his wife egg, and eventually you will have a normal baby. However, this is true. However, in the testes, there are really important cells that call sertoli cells, and these cells support the entire sperm production. Without them, you cannot generate normal sperm. So the goal of our lab was to try to generate these cells, because you cannot, cannot take just these cells from the testes of the patient. So in order to do that, <coughs> we use the same technique as these uh, Japanese did. We screen for factors. Fa when I say factor, I mean genes that can convert skin cells into Sertoli-like cells. And eventually, we have succeeded in identifying this factor. Next slide, please. So we identified five factors that when we introduce them into skin cells, they can convert them into these uh, sperm-supporting cells. What I show you here is a colony of cells. You have here many cells. Some of them we isolated directly from the testes, and some of them we converted from skin cells. And as you can see here, they look exactly the same. And the one that we converted from skin cells, we marked by these green dots. So you can see that this homogeneous colony is comprised of both endogenous cells and the cells that we induce from, uh, uh, from the skin cells. Next slide, please. So next we wanted to see whether they can indeed can support spermatogenesis. And the red dots here that you can see are the sperm. And as you can see, in our cells that we induce, you can see the highest amount of red dots which means that these cells are favorable for supporting a sperm production. Next slide. But eventually, we really wanted to see whether these cells can work and behave in the normal environment, which means in the testes. For that, we can take these cells, grow them as a sphere, inject them into an embryonic testes, and then test whether the cells can integrate into the testes in the right place. Next slide, please. And this is, I'm not sure you can see this very clearly. If you can turn off the light here, it will be great. So what you can see here is a short movie of, in the testes we have many tubes, many tubes that produce this sperm. And what you can see here are the red cells these are the, 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 the native sperm production cells. And you can see this arrow with a yellow one are those that we induce from skin cells. So this clearly shows that our cells know to migrate to the right place and act in the sperm production. Next slide, please. The next uh, example that I would like to show you is if we try to help men. Now I'm trying to help women. So this time we are talking about a placental stem cell. There are many couples that suffer from recurrent miscarriages, and we really want to identify the factor that can produce placental stem cell. Again, we did the same screen, and we identify uh, four factors that can produce this placental stem cell. One slide, please. The next slide, please. And as you can see here, the induced one is, is a colony of cells. The induced one are really similar to the, to the one that we isolated from the early embryo. Next slide, please. And when we inject them into early embryo, we can eventually see that they incorporated into a, a, a developed placenta. So this has no exactly where to go and participate in the formation of free placenta. So if you have now a woman that suffered from recurrent miscarriage because their placenta stem cells are dysfunctioning or not functioning, then we can use these induced stem cells in order to help them, help the embryo to implant in the womb. Next slide, please. And this is, I think, uh, the last example that I would like to show you. I think this is people like it the most because you can see it visually. 
So in this experiment, we took skin cells and convert them into heart cells. As you can see here, the cells are actually beating exactly like in the heart. The cells that surrounding these cells are those skin cells that did not go through this conversion. They did not become heart cells. And the cells that are here are those cells that we were able to convert into heart cells. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so of course I need to thank the people who did this work. This is my group. Uh, the funding uh, that we got in Israel and outside of Israel. And uh, we'd like to end up from in the last slide, if you can go one slide further. Um, I know when I uh, showed this presentation, many people come to me and ask whether they can participate in this kind of research. Next slide, please. And if, if you want to be part of it, so there are many ways that you can be involved. Uh, um, and you can just follow these points, either adopt the project of your interest, or adopt a student, or acquire an equipment from the lab. Um, this is only if, of course, you are interested in this kind of uh, research. Uh, with that, I will end up my talk, and I will thank you. very simple. Um, so you see, I've been working for four years with this kind of guys and reading uh, studies like this and uh, trying to understand how the quest for immortality isn't bullshit, but it's true, it's realistic. And the two main crazy discoveries are the Yamanaka factors that can rejuvenate cells. You take adult cells, you make them baby cells, basically, that can become any, any kind of part of body, of the human body. And the other discovery is the CRISPR-Cas9, the technique to uh, cut DNA and manipulate genetics. And you can play with this, like, uh, you know, Dr. Frankenstein, who, is, uh, who was created in Switzerland, in Geneva. Yeah. Uh, Frankenstein was uh, written here in Geneva. Uh, and he, so um, my question is, if you can rejuvenate cells, create the organs you like, and change the DNA, why do we still die? Okay, so this is a really good question. So eventually we die because of uh, organ failure. Eventually our heart doesn't work, our kidney, or our brain. So this is why we die eventually. So is it true that we can take now adult cells and convert them into uh, younger cells, or embryonic stem cell-like cells? Uh, however, we still need to be able to take these cells and generate an organ out of it and eventually be able to transplant it, transplant it back into the same patient and hopefully it will work. So, but this is true only for specific organs. Mm -hmm. We cannot rejuvenate every part of our body, at least not yet. Mm -hmm. You have shown in your uh, images that you are trying to find other factors, not the Yamanaka factors, the Buchanan factors. Uh, why do you think it's uh, important to, to, to find another road to create stem cells? Right, so the, the basic reason why we are trying to identify new factor, because as I showed you here, uh, currently the Yamanaka factor uh, are not good enough. Okay, at least this is my point of view. There are some scientists that think that, that they are good enough. But the quality of the cells can generate only retarded embryos, and we really need to identify the optimal condition or optimal factor that will generate high quality of cells. But as I showed you, we are also uh, generating placenta stem cells, mm -hmm. and we also can generate other cells that, are, that comprise the extra embryonic tissues, 
And the next question probably that you need to ask, why don't you generate an artificial embryo? Well, that's a very mad uh, <laughs> job you are doing. Uh, so e explaining is that he is trying right now, after placenta, after embryo, trying to create artificial life, life with no parents, no sperm, no ovule, just creating life because you are a god. Because I'm crazy. Okay, yeah, no, that's what I wanted you to say. Because think, people think I am the crazy guy, but he is. No, no. How, how, can you, how can you create a human being with no parents? Right, so of course this is not the, the, the reason why we are doing that. We are doing that in order to learn basic processes that will allow us eventually to find cure to many devastating diseases. However, in principle, if we have the cell that can generate the embryo, and we have the cell that can generate the placenta, so we have all the parts that you need in order to generate a, a, a healthy embryo. So till now, we still did, <coughs> didn't succeed in doing that. I still think that there is a role for God in this, uh, in this process. So it's like a rolling a snowball when a sperm fertilizes an egg, then everything happens intrinsic, inside the cells. Even if you will put outside factors, the process will be intrinsic and eventually will get an embryo. So I do think that the beginning start after fertilization. However, there are some work now that show that even if you start from the middle, when you have only the embryo cells already and the placenta stem cell, you still are able to get something that looks like an embryo. It still doesn't alive, but we might be there in uh, the next few years. Okay, I have an important question because my wife is pregnant and I want to know if I should eat the placenta. <laughs> it's a fashion now in California. Yeah, I, I heard about that. In Hollywood they are eating the placenta. Should I? Uh, is it good for me? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Eventually it goes to your stomach, so if there is anything good there, it probably is digested by your stomach, so... Okay. Uh, I... And other question, should I freeze the uh, umbilical cord? Uh, because <coughs> this also is, uh, sh sh is uh, something that people talk about. Yes. So this is a really fashion now, and I've been asked this question almost uh, every week, whether we should freeze uh, umbilical cord stem cells. So, uh, of course, I will not give you an answer now, because I'm, uh, <laughs> I don't want to, to be too uh, strict about it, but I believe that in the near future we will not, be, we will not need to use it, because this technique that I just showed you today we will be able to generate high quality stem cells also from skin cells. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meanwhile, if you have uh, spare money and uh, you want to do that, uh, you can do that. <laughs> okay. Um, what about bioprinting? I've heard uh, in, in this crazy novel, I've uh, met a lot of scientists, and some of them are trying to print organs with 3D bioprinters uh, using these machines to create organs. Uh, have you heard about that? Yes, of course. So this is uh, a main issue because we can generate cells of interest, blood cells, heart cells, but eventually we need to transplant an organ, a three-dimension organ. And just taking cells is not good enough. So we need to build a scaffold. So for that we have these printers that give us the exact scaffold, the exact structure of any organ that you like. And now the next goal is to fill it with the cells, with the relevant cells, and that they will reorganize themselves inside the scaffold in the correct way. And this is the challenge. Okay, we can print the scaffold of the organ, but now we are still lacking the knowledge 
of how to fill it correctly with all the different cell types that every organ has. It's not only one cell type. Yes, but here on your image, we can see a heart with stem cells created artificially that belong in the heart and work with the, the other cells. Right, so what did you see in my movie is heart cells, beating cells, which are great cells for transplantation. But, so this I will be able to use in order to recover scar or something like that that you have in the heart, but not to transplant a new heart. In order to transplant a new heart, I need to have a scaffold of a heart and then fill it correctly with these cells. So in the heart we have several kinds of cells, not only the beating one, also other cells, and in order to do it correctly, we need to learn how to organize the cells, the cells correctly inside the organ. There is, um, in, in when I, other people I met in, in the book, uh, one of them is George Church, uh, head of uh, the church lab in Harvard. He, he uh, studies pig organs. Uh, he's uh, trying to humanize pigs, changing the DNA of those animals and uh, trying to put uh, pig organs in human body. What do you think of that? Do you think it's crazy? Do you think it's possible? No, I, I don't think it's crazy. Uh, to put pig organ in human body, it might work somehow, but I think we can do even more than that. So what we can do, or might be able to do in the near future, is to generate human organ inside pig in order to have uh, body parts. So let me give you an example. Okay, for example, I can take a pig embryo and I can mutate an important genes, an important genes that is responsible for the formation of heart. Okay, so if I will let this embryo to grow, then the pig will die because he won't have in heart, in heart. So now, in this mutated embryo, I can introduce inside uh, human stem cells. And these human stem cells will be able to fill the part that is missing. So eventually we'll have a pig with human heart. Okay, we already show this with mouse and rat. Okay? Never, we never showed it with human, of course, and pig, but theoretically, uh, this can be a, a real thing in the near future. So you could imagine animal farms, like in the George Orwell novel, you could have big, big factories of pigs uh, used to create human organs yes. to save lives. Okay. You see, uh, he's more crazy than me. Um, but we're talking about the future. It's still not possible to do it now, so you can be relaxed, everything is fine. <laughs> about age reversal. Age reversal is, of course, the dream of all uh, mankind since uh, millenaries. But now it works on mice, because uh, when you inject the Yamanaka factors in some mice, uh, three years old, they become six months old. Uh, the organs are regenerated, uh, the skin changes, uh, everything is, looks like a young, a younger mice, mouse. Do you uh, think it would be possible to inject the bookending factors to uh, an old uh, guy like me and then I would be able to look like I'm 16? Okay, so uh, I must correct you a bit about your statement. So it's true that we can take skin cells and convert them into young stem cells, but we also lose the identity of the cells. So these skin cells eventually become embryonic stem cells, so they are not skin cells anymore. So if theoretically you will put these Yamanaka factors in your body, your entire body will become embryonic stem cells. It's not that you will become young yet. Okay? So, we can take a bit the old cells and become them younger, but you cannot rejuvenate the, the person itself. So what would happen? I would melt, or I would burn, or I would look no, like... No, you will have a lot, of, a lot of tumors. Ah, okay. That's what we <laughs> have. No thanks. However, however, before you ask it, so there is a way... It there, works on mouse. It, not in that way. Let me show you how it can, it can work at least partially. 
So the young market capital indeed can reverse. Uh, there is a new term that I didn't talk about uh, in the um, in the my, in my lecture, which is epigenetics. In, in besides DNA, we have also molecules that sit on the DNA, and these molecules are really important. And scientists already showed that there is a, a drift of this molecule during life. So when you be, become old, you have this drift of this molecule, and this is eventually why people die, because the organ is not working anymore because of this drift. So these Yamanaka's factors knows how to take this drift backward, and they can revert it, which is great. So now the challenge that we have is to revert this drift without changing the identity of the cells. Okay, which means we need to introduce this Yamanaka's factor, but to a very short time, and then stop it. And then again, express it, and then stop it. And, this what, and what happens by that, you can remove this drift without changing the identity of your cells. So the skin cells will stay skin cells, and everything will be okay. Okay. Um, are there fashions in science? Uh, let me explain. Uh, 15 years ago, my friend Michel Welbeck, a famous French writer, he wrote about cloning, human cloning. It was a fashion, a people thought that we would become immortal using cloning. Now, you don't talk about cloning anymore and you talk about uh, the stem cells and uh, the DNA. So, why uh, is cloning out of fashion? So, cloning is not <laughs> out of fashion. So the experiment that I showed you that we generate mice on these embryonic stem cell like cells is actually cloning. Mm -hmm. And what I'm taking is the skin cells from a mouse, mm -hmm. then I generate these embryonic stem cells and generate a new mouse that is similar exactly to the mouse that I took the skin cells from him. So this is still a cloning. Mm -hmm. In the cloning, we can clone the animal or whatever we want, but it's not helping you in, in your own uh, desire or your own uh, um, willing to be younger. Mm -hmm. So it can help you maybe to generate organ parts, but nobody will clone himself only to have a, a no, part of it's, organ. It's a, it's a new human being. Yes, so it's a new human being, yeah. and anyway, you will need to wait until you will become 18, and yeah, then and you be, will be able to take his part. And it would be illegal to kill me. Yes. Okay, uh, um, so, uh, about, yeah, we were talking before about mistakes. Many discoveries were made after mistakes, or just imagination, or trying something that looks absurd, and suddenly it works. Uh, can you develop just on this? And so, uh, there is, it's completely true. So, luck and mistake and imagination is really important uh, determinant for your capability to discover new stuff. And there are many examples in history that uh, mistakes uh, uh, have led to really interesting discoveries. A penicillin, uh, I don't remember exactly the story, but there was uh, a really great uh, story about a mistake that eventually have led to the development and identification of antibiotics. Mm. Um, so I go back to the question of this debate. The quest for immortality, is it reality or bullshit? I think that we are in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be uh, true in the future, I would not say near future, but who knows, maybe in 50, 100 years, uh, we will be able to find the, uh, the uh, protocol to, <laughs> to rejuvenize ourselves. <laughs> That's too long for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you, when, when we met two years ago in Jerusalem, uh, the end of our conversation was very pessimistic. Because uh, you said, uh, you said the same thing, maybe we will find the answer to immortality and solve the problem of aging, but Earth will be dead before that. 
because of what we are doing to the environment. Are you very uh, worried about uh, the environment? You say we, can, we still have 100 years. I think maybe 200 years. Oh, okay, optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we definitely ruin our uh, health and the environment is really important. And yeah, if we will keep that way, we definitely will destroy our own. Um, yes. I have so many questions, but then, uh, I think it's important to let uh, some of you, if you want, ask to ask questions uh, to him or to me. Uh, just one last question. It's very provocative, so I, I, f I feel sorry for asking you this, uh, but. I feel that you know that I respect you and, I, and we are friends, so I can ask you this. Uh, because we talk about DNA and gen genetically modifying human beings and trying to improve human beings, make them superior. So this leads to many moral issues, and I know you know it, uh, many uh, ethical questions. Uh, and so my question is very scandalous. But, how can a Jew work on something that fulfills the dream of Hitler? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we are trying to do our best. Of course, we are not trying to generate superhero or people with uh, no, uh, no, uh, yeah. that they are fantastic and great. We are just trying to a fine cue for devastating diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I did it. Yeah, I have a mic. And just a question on artificial intelligence. Do you think uh, real artificial intelligence can only occur when we'll be able to combine uh, human parts and uh, uh, electronic? I mean, I mean, that's the way a uh, few people think. So do you think it can really happen or is it like just like a, a fantasy? Uh, this is really a great question. And I do think, I'm not sure that I'm right, but I do think that you will need to combine the tissue, human tissue, with uh, electronic in order to get the best uh, results. But I'm not an expert in uh, artificial intelligence. Thank you. They are trying to work on uh, Connectome. Connectome is, uh, uh, well, some of the pretty guys in America, <laughs> they are trying to imitate the human brain with computers. Maybe that was your uh, question, and it's uh, not working at all. But if it works, it would be uh, possible that we uh, transform our brains into um, Macintosh, and we, be, we will become Siri, <laughs> which would be very sad. No. First, thank you very much for, for the very interesting lecture. Could you maybe expand a little bit on how do you think the uh, research process you're currently doing will translate to uh, clinical efficiency? How is the process working from what you guys are doing in the uh, theoretical research into actual hospitals and things? So, great question. So, right now, I think the only limitation that we have is the capability to generate high quality cells. But eventually, in every hospital, you have a lab, so a patient can just enter the physician, the physician can take a skin biopsy from him, bring the skin biopsy into the lab, then you will need about three weeks in order to convert this skin cell into any cell type of interest. And then the next step is just to transplant these cells into the same patient. So theoretically, this can be done immediately, However, we are still afraid that because we are not sure we are generating the highest quality cells, that we, these cells might lead into a, a tumorigenic uh, process or something that we don't want to deal with. So once we are sure that the cells, the cells are safe and of high quality, then we can do it. I can tell you that already today, these days, there are some clinical trials 
with this sense in cells that belong to the eye. And there is a specific reason why they choose them, because they know that they are relatively safe, and if they are not, they can remove it. And they are already clinical trials with this sense. So it is definitely going to this direction. Thank you. Uh, a long time ago, the Russian may say down uh, with DNA to do uh, to, to some computation and even uh, storing information on higher ranges. What are the prospects for uh, to have a computer uh, based on uh, DNA, which uh, can uh, somehow be a uh, uh, solution for the quantum computer? So uh, again, this is not a field that I'm completely familiar with. I think that the only, or not the only, or main reason why to use it is only because you can store a lot of data in a very small piece. So this is, I think, the advantage of uh, developing this method of uh, storing data on a piece of DNA. But this is not my field, and I, I don't have any other knowledge about it. Uh, what I've heard uh, is that <coughs> in Harvard now they have uh, stored a movie in uh, in a bacteria. So there is uh, you can put some uh, cultural uh, information in uh, biology in, in real life, which is funny. They did it just for fun, but <laughs> they succeeded. Also now uh, George Church is working on rewriting the human genome. You know that in uh, the past uh, years, the conquest was to uh, sequence the human genome. Uh, it has been done, and now they are rewriting it, writing a more perfect genome, which is very frightening. And uh, the project is called the Human Genome Right, like the word, the verb, right to write. Uh, so it's it's really a new frontier, and in many, many fields, it really looks like science fiction. That's why I, I wanted to, to explore it, because you have no limit to what you can do. Uh, they, they, they took uh, DNA of uh, Medus. Uh, how do you call it? Jellyfish. Jellyfish. <laughs> DNA of jellyfish, you put it in a mouse, and the mouse is green and fluorescent in the night, in the dark. <laughs> it worked. So it's, it's, so uh, it, it does, it's uh, useless, except when you are in the dark and you want to no, see it. It's, it's where not it's actually dark. useless. Actually, I thought about it in my first degree. Yeah. I know about this protein mm -hmm. called GFP, and we thought about let's engineer trees that express this protein. And then you don't need to have lamp in the street. You just have uh, trees that are glowing with GFP. Demonstration of what I said before. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 the most cra one of the craziest things that I've heard when I was uh, in America was uh, uh, in Harvard also, they want to uh, bring back the dinosaurs. Like in uh, the, the film, the, the book, uh, Jurassic Park, he imagined in his novel, uh, Michael Crichton imagined they take DNA from uh, dinosaurs and put it in uh, the egg of, I think, a chicken. Or ostrich, ostrich, and and they, they now they're working on it uh, on the mammals. <laughs> so these things are uh, everything you can imagine is now possible. Uh, um, thank you for the presentation, quite interesting. Um, a few days ago, an American investment bank make a comment on a conference or an analyst was that the cure of different diseases goes against the business model of the pharma industry. And uh, talking about ethical issues, um, what, how do you see these forces? Because normally we say money talks. Um, how you see this uh, in your environment? Uh, what kind of forces are playing? and what kind of solution you see uh, to this contradiction on, or fight between financial interests and the well-being of human beings? Mm. 
this is a great question. Uh, I don't have the solution for that. I agree that there is a, a conflict of interest here, and, and there is a problem uh, that the company wants to earn money, but we want to save people. But I, in my experience, I never saw before uh, a drug that is working and people don't get it because the company is trying to hide it. Although I'm not in this field, I'm not speaking directly with uh, pharmaceutical companies, but I never encountered it uh, before. But and this is what I can say about this issue. But I see the problem here, and when a good drug is out there, people will know about it, and they will will be happy to uh, um, develop it and sell it eventually. Thank you very much for answering all those questions. Now our general director, Mrs. Bunio, we will uh, close the event. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. But the, my accent is not much better than yours. <laughs> so I'll just add one more accent. Thank you for being available for us tonight. Although there's a big week coming on for you. I cannot tell you how great it is to have you. I think everybody's excited to know more. And I think we just have to keep on producing, right? And having uh, kids <laughs> soon, right? So for all of us. Parents. Well, that's Chanel BT. Thank you for lending us the auditorium with a few little <laughs> details coming on. Sorry for the delay of this conference. Audrey David Sikorsky, thank you for always being here for us, supporting brain research and all other research at the Hebrew University and other things that you do. Thank you. Comité de l'Equipe, the Hebrew University, thanks a lot also for all your <coughs> energy that you devote to us. We hope that you all can make it once to Israel to see all these labs. I think Federico can say they're interesting and people are very interesting, so we hope you can make it. The books are down if you want to buy the books. Payo has brought their books generously so that Federico can sign them and have a drink downstairs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julius. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.